Hello and welcome to the Bright Talk DevOps Agile ITSM channel. My name is David Smith. I'm the president of Micromation and I will be your presenter for today's session on Need for Speed, Digital Transformation and DevOps. And the question is really, is DevOps the curse or the cure for digital transformation, sensational need for speed? If you have any questions, please uh, type them into the question box and at the end of the session I will try and answer the questions, time permitting of course. This session is being recorded and it will be made available for your reference, so let's get started. Well thank you very much for joining. Uh, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about digital transformation and how it's really starting to shake things up. And what I wanted to do is to kind of talk about my observation from what I've seen happen over, I'm going to start like 20 years ago. I've been in management consulting practices for quite some time now. And back in the 2000 timeframe, you know, we all remember the dot-com boom bust uh, event that happened back then. So really, if you think back, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen there, but there's a lot of excitement around the internet and how things were going to shake up uh, how we did business. And, uh, you know, things happened. We weren't sure which companies were going to work. And in the end, there was a lot of companies that went, went bust. And when you look back and try to figure out, well, what really happened? How do we know that things were uh, working or not working? And, and, and there was a lot of uh, darkness to that. But th shortly after that, there were some great books that came out that started to explain how the successful companies were actually uh, being, you know, overcoming and figuring out how to make money on the internet. That was the big question. So, uh, you know, books like Blue Ocean Strategy, Lean Startups, Lean Analytics, Value Proposition Design, Business Model Generation started to illuminate how this whole thing started to work. And as a result of that, a lot of companies started to figure out the secret formula that, that made this all work. And there was some great stuff that started happening after that. And this is where a lot of digital disruption sort of most recently takes place and certainly in the, uh, in the, in the digital era. So the first uh, observation I want to point out, and I'm going to go through five of them, but the first one is all about lean startups. And uh, disruption starts when we start to see this thing that was nicknamed the, the smack stack. This is the social, mobile, analytical, and cloud area. And in this particular case, we had uh, a lot of disruption starting to happen where companies were starting to mix these new technologies together and uh, get some success with it. And they're creating new products and, and new things that we didn't think of before. And again, using these strategies from like Blue Oceans and lead startups. And then uh, along comes another wave of things. And this is like more recently in the last five or seven years. And that's with now the, 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 the immense computing power, things like robotics and AI and digital twin and blockchain are some very uh, profound different changes. And, and it's really the combination of these things that when you mix them together and, and, and start to create new ideas and new thinkings, this is where the real transformation is, is able to take place. And there's some great stories of, of which uh, a lot of you have heard these, and, and here's just some names that, that, that we all know of. Um, but the one that I'm going to focus on too, and just to give an illustrative example, if, if you go back and think of Netflix, and back in 1997, they kind of started their business model, and they were competing against a company called Blockbuster. It was all about, uh, you know, renting videos. And this was a new way to get entertainment that was competing against the cinemas. And so Blockbuster was a bricks and mortar company. It had a lot of buildings, uh, thousands of them across you know, North America. And uh, the, the different model that, that Netflix, or Netflix brought to the table was the notion that they didn't have any locations. They did everything through mail order. So they would you know, rent you a video and, and they had a different pricing structure. So they didn't have all this cost. So the first disruption that happened there was, was there was a significantly lower cost model. And uh, I don't know if you recall, but Blockbuster's strategy was if you didn't have the videos back by a certain time frame, you'd get penalized. And, and that went away with Netflix's model. They didn't penalize you. So the, there was a, a, a more uh, better user experience there. 
Well, then that got totally disrupted in 2007 when, when they went to a different model. They actually even disrupted themselves. Netflix started streaming their videos, and then that kind of like, killed uh, Blockbuster. And just recently, this week, actually, I read in the paper, the last store, uh, there's like three of them left, and they're being shut down this week. And they're, they're in re very remote lo lo locations like um, Anchorage and Fairbanks up in Alaska. So this, so this is one example. Now, this whole thing took, uh, you know, a better part of 18 years, 19, 20 years to, to happen. But a more recent example, if you look at Amazon uh, and how fast things move now, Amazon's a very fast mover. Uh, this year, they got a lot of political pressure. Uh, you know, that they thought they were being taken, they were taking advantage of the uh, UPS, US, U.S. Postal Service, I should say. And so this is in April. And by June, Amazon announces a completely new business model whereby they're starting a, a, uh, a new organization. It's a premier driver service where it's a franchise and you, you buy into it for $10,000 and, and uh, you become a, a new business model for delivering the last mile of Amazon products to their, to their uh, customers. So this, this happened in like two months. So it's just am amazing how things fast are moving now. So the, the pace of change has really picked up and, and, and this is really what's driving. This is the third uh, observation here. Pace of change is accelerating like at a tremendous pace where people can come up with ideas and overnight sort of test them out and they do small trials and they fail fast and, and figure out what part of it does work and what parts don't work and learn by that and they're able to uh, you know create new business models and, and, and tap into them and so that continues on to the fourth area and that's um, there's been another kind of big shift in the last uh, 10 or 12 years and it's all about shareholder value and the corporations and uh, first and foremost the most important thing that uh, you know corporations look at it, it, it is increasing shareholder value and if even that means cutting costs and reducing resources they're prepared to do that so there's been a lot of pressure to do more with less and they're trying to force uh, these situations by using technology and uh, leveraging it so you're still expected to, you know, deal with the change, put out the daily fires and, and, and take on more work, manage more change, and at the same time, uh, deal with risk and all of this. So there's very uh, much a lot of pressure on, on people, uh, it, particularly having to do more and trying to figure out how or what not to do or by removing waste. So this is another area where we're working with a, a scarcity of resources trying to take on a, on a lot more work. And then the last observation that I wanted to share with you before I get into the DevOps piece is the need for quality. Uh, social systems, social media in particular, is so good now at uh, sharing with everybody uh, how well we perform. So. Uh, reviews and likes and and ways that you can get classified as for how well did the last experience go with your customers uh, it, it's all out there it's in front of everyone so uh, this really makes it important to make sure that you do a great job because you're going to be rated and typically what happens is, is that Human nature is, is that people like to talk more about negative things than positive things. And there's a, an old rule of five that says it's, it's five times more likely that somebody's going to uh, share a negative experience than a positive one. So you, you need to really figure out how to, to drive quality and perfection so that you get way more positive reviews than negative reviews. And people use this now faithfully to go in and assess you know, the, how likely they are to use your products and services. So it's extremely important to make sure you get good quality controls in place. So, you, you, you know, you're probably asking, well, what's this got to do with DevOps and why should I even care about this? Well, he, here's what it's coming down to. Uh, you should really care because the whole marketplace is going 
undergoing a dramatic shift and change. And there's going to be a lot of jobs that, that traditionally we, we, we are familiar with that are they're going to go away. And things like robotics and software and artificial intelligence is going to make that, that, that possible. Now, it's not going to happen overnight, but it is happening. Uh, it, we're seeing it. it. It's there. So there's all kinds of jobs that, that potentially could replace uh, people doing uh, educational management, accommodation, food services, manufacturing. And then there's a huge list of things that, that robotics potentially could take over, not just making cars. Uh, you, you know, they're in our homes now and household and, and, and all in place. So a lot of this is uh, now, now happening as we speak. And so this is this is why we need to pay attention and we need to prepare ourselves because there's going to be a lot of a uh, dis lot more disruption coming our way. So this comes down to so how is this affecting DevOps and what what's the connection here? Well, that's really uh, I think DevOps is is part of what makes this even possible. So I want to explain first of all what the value proposition is of digital transformation. And it starts with the customer. Obviously, on the right-hand side, we've got the customer. Customer's king. They kind of have uh, things that they need and want and outcomes that they desire, and they create the demand. And then on the left side of the equation, we've got the providers, the people that supply you know, the value. And in the middle is kind of the business model that makes it all work. In the center, there is the uh, value stream, which is the things that we do to provide the outcomes and or the products and services that we deliver to our customers. And then there's other dimensions that are at play. So depending on how attractive they are, we'll create how much pull there is or demand customers will want of our products. So the more attractive or more interesting or unique that we make them, then uh, there's going to be a lot more people wanting uh, to, to uh, consume those products. So new things coming to the marketplace create a lot of pull. Uh, this creates opportunities to get revenue. So if there's a lot of pull and it, and it provides a lot of value, then we're probably able to charge a little bit more for those uh, services or indoor products as, that we bring to the marketplace. Conversely, uh, we also need to be mindful of the cost to deliver these products and services, and as well how efficient we, we can actually get them out the door or flow them through the system. So these are the, the four main dimensions that people in, in, in um, trying to improve their business and their value proposition, they focus on any one of these buttons you can press on and actually uh, do a better job. So where does digital transformation come into play? Well, there's two big plays that digital transformation allows us to do. One is an optimization play, and this is typically where a lot of organizations spend a time. They're trying to improve their existing offerings and either make them flow faster, uh, deliver them faster, or reduce cost. And um, this particular area, if, if you've ever read the Blue Ocean uh, book, the, the theory behind this is, is that this is mostly where people compete and play, and, th and this is what they call the Red Ocean. And this is where a lot of people are competing and fighting for a market position and a battleground and or a market space that, that they, they uh, are all competing in. And then there's the other area, and it's the top right-hand quadrant, and this is the disruption area. And this is where we create new and or enhanced offerings. And this is where you, you take those innovative technologies and you mix them together into new combinations. And... Mixing them together, what they look to do is, is find new ways to uh, do things that the other guys don't offer. So a good example is if, um, if you can do things without having uh, bricks and mortar or assets or investments in assets, that is a good strategy that a lot of organizations are typically trying to embark on. So you'll notice that the Airbnb and the Ubers, uh, their apps and their solutions, they don't, they don't even own the assets. The, the assets are owned by someone else. So this is very creative and how they disrupted uh, the, the, the different areas. So, so these are the different strategies that are at play. And the faster you can get new ideas to market and keep them flowing ahead of your competitors, 
gives you a small window of opportunity that you can have to take a leading position to uh, prosper in that area. So this is where the DevOps comes becomes very important because a lot of these uh, new thinkings are based on, on uh, technologies and getting either new apps at the door or new capabilities at the door. This, just to give you a little history lesson, uh, a brief history on DevOps, it, it, it kind of formulated grassroots style back in 2007. Patrick Dubois uh, and a number of us other folks got together and said, you know what, you, you know, we're constantly battling between the developers and the operations people. Why can't we collaborate together and figure out how to solve some of these issues? And the issues that they were talking about, you know, were things like they were producing products that customers uh, didn't really like or it took so long to release them and, and get them out the door that uh, customers weren't quite sure that that's really what they wanted. Sometimes there was a lot of bugs and errors. It was very time consuming, a lot of manual work. It took a lot of effort and it, it was very costly to do this. And, and it's because the, the teams didn't work well together and they just didn't have good uh, systems that, that allowed them to do this at a higher frequency and, and pace. So uh, th these guys got together and they said, you know, what's different about us? Well, traditional thinking is on the left side, you've got the developers where, you know, they are really focusing on adding features and changing quickly is good. And so that's the focus that they had. And that, that was their culture and thinking. On the right hand side, and, and this is the uh, conflict, is, is that operational people like to keep things stable and fast and change is not good. So that's where they were at odds. And so uh, they, they were constantly battling back and forth and trying to um, you know, compete against one another. And when they started to look at, well, what are the problems that were plaguing them? It was things that they operated independently. They had a different way of thinking. They were like silos. They had um, different tool sets, excessive rework because they throw things over the fence, the proverbial fence. and try things out, it didn't work, it would go back. And so processes were disjointed. And there was a number of factors that just made this very, very difficult to, um, to, to make them work efficiently together. So these guys got together and they formulated uh, sort of a more uh, efficient and, and fluid process or a way, a workflow to work together. And this was sort of where DevOps was born. It was born by the people doing it. It's not a product, it's not a specific uh, job title. It, it's more of an experience and, and, and it came down to that there's a life cycle that they follow and you start with planning and then you plan what the customer wants, you develop the code, you build it, you test it, you release it and then deploy, operate and monitor it. Now that's a typical kind of flow, but where they, they made it better is by putting new principles and thinking in place that helped uh, you know, make this much more efficient and effective. And this is where some new organizations started to formulate that were observing this. And, and one uh, organization is the DevOps Agile Skills Association, referred to as DASA. Uh, DASA, a number of years ago, got together and they got a number of people from different groups that were uh, pioneering this. And they observed and they documented what is it that these guys are doing that they're actually getting some success. And they came up with six key or core principles. And, and the principles were things like customer-centric actions, create outcomes, end-to-end uh, -end responsibilities, cross-functional teams, continuous improvement, and automation. And, and I'll dive a little bit into each of those just to kind of give the context here. So principle number one was making sure that everything that you did was for customers and that it was uh, in, in the hopes that you're going to create new and inventive, in, inventive things. So that took courage. And to do that, the, you had to overcome the fear of failure because um, often in the past, if you failed, then you know, you'd lose your job. But here there's a notion that you need to experiment. And so you need to take risk. And risk takers are the, are the ones that, that invents, invent things. So this is principle number one, is just that you focus with what the customers want and you take uh, you know, more of an inventive approach to it. The second principle is focusing on, you know, with the customer 
end result in mind. So this meant looking at what is it ultimately that you're trying to do with, with this end result and focus on <clears throat> more of the, the benefits that the client was trying to achieve. And you did this uh, in a way that, that you collaborated together to find out what's the most quick method that we could put that together and, and get brainstorming and creative juices happening. And then in part of doing that, you instilled a new kind of responsibility uh, effort in place where you had end to end responsibility. And this is sort of a governance framework where people actually cared about what they did and they knew what role they played and they knew how they, uh, they contributed to the team. So it was a lot of team spirit that was uh, encouraged at, at uh, getting people to respond at a higher level of performance in a team fashion. And in order for that to work well, principle number four is, is that you need to understand what the other guys did. So as part of the skills development, we had to um, develop skills profiles that you understood what the, the, the um, architects did and what the developers were doing and, and how people move things into operation. So everybody needed to uh, work together and understand each other's roles. And this is where they came up with the notion of what they refer to as T profile skills, where you have a lot of general skills that you understand what everybody's doing in the big picture, and then very deep uh, subject matter expertise and, and, and looking at how um, to be perf perfect things in certain areas. So this helped uh, better understand how the teams could work together because they, they were more empathetic with each other and some of the challenges and, and, and issues that they had to deal with. And then principle number five is all around continual improvement. The notion that experimentation was good, but you wanted to fail fast so that you didn't get too big or out of control before it was too late. And as you learned things, you needed a good uh, feedback loop. You were able to figure out ways to error proof things at the source, meaning before that could cause uh, too much disruption too late in the development cycle. So born into this was the notion of continual improvement embedded in the, in the way that they do things. And the last uh, principle is automate everything that you can. So looking at the compl complete workflow, take a look at every little aspect and figure out if there's something that you could do to, to automate or, or remove steps so that they didn't have to be done or, or errors could not be created. And, and that was a, another leading principle. So, so those were the patterns that uh, DASA uh, unveiled from these uh, early adopters and actually started documenting in the form of training. And, and you're going to hear more about that shortly. But, you know, if we look now at here we are in 2018, what have we actually learned? Does this work? So obviously we know the leaders are disrupting the marketplace. We see evidence of that. The Amazons, the Airbnbs, uh, Netflix, Facebook, Spotify, Uber, they, they've created these, these models now and it's, they're, they're kind of like the gold standard and they're, they're the ones that are leading this place. So, you know, examples are there that we can look to, towards these companies and see, yes, it actually works. But how does it work? Well, there's some other really good information that's being produced on a regular base, basis. And one, one example I want to bring here is um, one of the tool providers called Puppet uh, produces a report every year called State of the DevOps Marketplace or Market Segmentation. And they've been doing this for a few years now. And the 2017 report, this is the one that I'm referring to, uh, it currently is... Uh, measuring performance and so one of the things they do is they they survey over 3,000 organizations and they say hey how are you doing and performing you know before and after so they benchmarked people before they did the devops and then afterwards and what they started reporting on was two uh, critical performance factors one is the throughput and they, they sort of looked at high performing organizations versus uh, new performers or, or beginners and they found that the high performing organizations, the ones that had actually implemented successfully the DevOps, DevOps kind of practices, were able to put code, now this is from inception through to deploying it, through the organization 46 times faster 
than um, organizations that were not doing this. And they were able to commit it and get it deployed 440 times faster. So throughput is unbelievably fast. Now, 2016 report, the numbers were even more staggering, but uh, the, the, the new organizations and more and more people are adopting this so that the, the margins are getting um, closer to one another. So they're not as dramatic. The second key performance factor is stability. Stability of the systems. It's great to put things out fast, but if you put them out and they fail, that's not good. So stability is all about successful changes. And if you do have something that doesn't work, how quickly can you recover in the meantime to restore or recover from downtime? So again, if we look at the high performers versus you know new, new beginners, high performers are 96 times faster in being able to recover if they do have an issue. And in terms of failed changes, they're five times lower in the sense of failed changes. So five times lower failed changes and being able to deploy it. So this is evidence that this stuff really does work. These are the lessons learned. I'm not gonna stop there because there's some other great information by some other organizations. There's another report, 2018, it's called the State of DevOps. It's by Interop. Um, they also did a deeper dive. They not only looked at you know high level things, they got really into the weeds and smaller sample size, but they started looking at, well, you know, what's the expected timeline of how quickly you're going to adopt? And what they found was that in 2018, 68% uh, of the organizations have already done it or they're doing it right now, so this year. Um, so there's a huge um, tidal wave of new organizations uh, up and running on this. So this is this is mainstream now. You, you've got to be on board here. Now, they also looked at... Um, you know, the benefits of DevOps and, the, and they're asking, you know, what are the specifics that you're actually seeing? What, what is, what are you uh, uh, learning from this? And they found that the number one item, and I only listed the top five because they had, you know, maybe a dozen, but of the top five, increased fre frequency of deployments was number one, improved quality of performance of deployed applications, meaning that they, they worked much more uh, efficiently was number two, uh, a reduction in time spent fixing and maintaining applications was number three, re reduction in, in time to market, that's getting through the whole life cycle, and increased collaboration between departments. So these are the top kind of benefits that they're seeing in, in, in doing that. And that supports uh, the, 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 the digital transformation value proposition that I showed you earlier. They also got into uh, evidence that there is improved application development speed uh, of all the companies surveyed, 89% saw either some or some significant improvement to uh, how quickly they were able to get things out the door. And um, that kind of concludes that particular area. So th th that's evidence that's out there now. And by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the links to these reports um, at the end of the presentation here, I've got uh, it that you'll be able to download and, and use those refer references. So um, th there's a lot of evidence here that this is actually profound working and uh, it is something that you need to get into place. So if you haven't started down this path, this is uh, sort of a roadmap for you to get there quickly. The first part I want to talk about is some of the key disciplines that you need to uh, put in effect. And one is I refer to it as the as the management triad. There's three key disciplines that that are at play here. Uh, there's ITIL, the IT infrastructure library. There's lean, lean IT or the or the lean thinking, and agile. It's the three of these together that actually help you uh, re-engineer these processes and make them work more harmoniously uh, together from the different teams and. I tell, I think most people are fairly familiar with this. It's, it's been around for quite some time. Uh, it is a library of better practices and specifically the meat is in the service transition area. People often refer to this as change, release and deployment. Uh, that's sort of the, the, the base practices and those 
are um, the detailed descriptions of the uh, nomenclature and the methods that are being used. But to make this work, that's the, you know, what is it? But how does it work? What we found is extremely, uh, you know, successful here is the notion of agile. Agile um, has been very popular as well over the last 10, 12 years. Um, the key difference between traditional waterfall and an agile method is waterfall is you create this new product or service and you have to have it fully complete before you can actually launch it. Uh, so the development cycles are longer, um, you, you know, months, years sometimes um, to get a product at the door and you don't get any value or use out of it until the whole thing is completed versus Agile is trying to get the minimum viable product or service uh, out the door or usable in some fashion. It's not complete, but at least there's some uh, notional benefit that you could get out of it. And, and this is the way that they can kind of get things out the door and test things early and get feedback so that it may not be exactly what the customer was looking at. And they're able to adapt and, and morph and change very quickly to do this. And so it's an iterative model that, uh, that it works through. And that's a very powerful method for working on this. Now, optimizing this, this is where we turn to lean. And lean thinking is uh, uh, more of a, a way of looking at what is it the customer really wants and values. So, so it's all about what the outcomes that the customer is striving for. And then it looks at what are the actual activities or things that we do that are contributing to that value and what are the items that may be considered wasteful or don't actually deliver value. And if we can get rid of those things, through either automation or if we engineer our, our process, then that's how we can make ourselves more efficient. And this is where we're, we're able to um, work on more things when we do have limited resources. So that is the method that people are using to do that. Now, here's some examples of, uh, of these items at play. So here's a traditional software process flow and fairly complex, but you can kind of see across the the top that you know this typically takes weeks or even months to deploy uh, software you have siloed teams traditionally that they're doing manual builds uh, they manually test things or maybe they don't test things and then manually deploy it and then uh, provision those items to the actual final destination of the production environments or services service that they intend to reside on and each of those areas, you can see that there's a lot of opportunity for waste to occur. There's things like handoffs and rework and uh, errors and, and uh, things that don't work well. Now, I can attest to this being a consultant because uh, a lot of work that I've done over the last 15 years or so has been in the change, release, and deployment area. And I get called in to um, improve the change management process because everything gets white labeled as a change, change management doesn't work. But when you go in and actually look under the covers, uh, one of the steps that we do is we take all the activities and we map them out in a timeline. And this is called a value stream analysis. And you look at each type of activity and you codify whether it is value providing or wasteful non-value. Non -value. And you would be just, floored to, to see how much uh, work that we actually do that is considered waste. And you can see on this timeline here, all the red stuff is non-value added work. It's things that because you're operating manually and you're doing rework and things are failing, uh, that they cause all kinds of, of issues and burn up all of our resources. And when you look into root cause, what you find is, is that a lot of times it's because we don't have good error proofing and we don't have automation and therefore it drains our people. So we use Herculean effort to, to, to overcome these things. And this clogs up our workflows and causes us to be very inefficient, slow and, 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 and not good at doing that. So where does DevOps come in? Well, they, they kind of re-engineered this whole thing and using a better way to get team spirit and people collaborating and working together, you know, face to face uh, and, and tearing down that wall 
and, and putting things like automation in place, they're able to promote things very quickly using things like agile and automation, building automated test cycles and automated deployment and provisioning. And this removes the waste. And now it, it comes down to a matter of minutes that we can deploy uh, things in, in this new uh, form of delivering services. So I, I talked a lot about the people side of it. Now what I'd like to do is switch gears a little bit, talk a, a little bit about the automation, because this is, uh, I think, where the real focus has been uh, and a lot of the success. I think we've probably done more work in automation than we have uh, in, in the process side, but this is the sort of notion behind it. The thinking behind this is often referred to as shift left automation strategy. And the, and the thinking is, is that the more we can actually automate and shift things left, meaning left in the process cycle, getting it more to the front end of the process, uh, the more we're able to error-proof things and get it almost to a self-serve model. So this is the concept to how it actually works. And putting that in place or into, into, into real-life mode, really what we're striving for is a, a an environment that runs 24 7 and everything is continuous and everything's sitting there running uh waiting for you to actually um con continuously develop something continuously test it deploy it and um it goes into these automated loops and the loops um go through the sequence and verify that yes this is uh, ready to promote we can actually uh, put it into a testing cycle, it goes through a series of automated tests and are able to uh, and eventually uh, operate it and deploy it into the production environment and be able to pull it back if we find something that our tests didn't uh, pick up on. So this is highly automated and how they're actually doing this is there's an, a, a tremendous amount of automation tools at companies. These are new startups. Uh, this is a, a good example of, of uh, new startups that have come up from nowhere. And there's a, a number of companies that are out there. And here's just a table uh, that I found from a pretty good source. And, and I, as I said, I've included these sources in a document for you. But there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, here's the top 50 best tools or the top 30. And I put a, a lot of these top lists of tools that are out there today that are pretty popular. Now, this this is a, a point in time. If this thing's changed next week, it'll be different. but um, that's sort of um, available to you. Now, if I look at where is this uh, going, where does this, how does this work in, in the orchestration of these tools throughout the life cycle, let's kind of walk you through. In the early parts of the life cycle, when you're planning and coding, JIRA, JIT, uh, and another one, um, <clears throat> which I cannot read its name because this print's too small, but I'll continue down the list, building and testing, Maven, Gradle, uh, Apache Ant, um, then we've got Selenium, JUnit for testing, automated testing, and then integration. There's things like Jenkins, Bamboo, Hudson. And on the deployment side, we've got Docker, Puppet, Vagrant, Chef, SaltStack, Ansible. And finally, on the monitoring side, we've got ElkStack, Splunk, and Agios. Now, these are just some of the tools. There's, there's many, many more. But what's happening is a lot of these tools are, are now integrating with one another and uh, fully um, able to communicate and, and, and flow things through the, orchestrate things through the entire process uh, and, and automate that um, to make it much more uh, uh, workable. So how to pick up the pace. Uh, first thing is, is that you need to invest in yourself and your team. You, if you've not gone through any formal type of training, this is sort of the first step is you need to get up to speed a uh, great place to, sp to start is with DASA's competency framework. There's five levels of maturity. The first one starts with the fundamental. It's a three-day course. You can get this in an e-learning format and or a virtual classroom. I'm going to give you some, uh, some examples of different classes that you take. There's a practitioner level, and then there's more specialized areas as well. So there's a career path here that you can go through and learn from. So the, the benefits to this are twofold. Uh, one is for you personally and or your teams, 
uh, it really helps increase your value within your organization. It gives you uh, the ability to help implement these models successfully and better understand how the consumer is thinking and from the business perspective. And this, by learning this, will make you stand out in the marketplace and make you more of a prospect for employment. And, and I think that's the key thing here is that with all these jobs going down the tubes or things changing so quickly, you want to have a good skills base. This one's going to require uh, good competent people for some time. And, and when you look at how much money they can make, it, it is very attractive. So that that is uh, something that you want to get those skills. Uh, from an organizational point of view, you, you kind of have to have this now, this ability, or you're not going to be able to keep up with your competitors. They're going to create something new, a new app's going to show up. If you're a brick, brick and mortar company, um, you need to respond to that or at least uh, keep up or you're, you're in the red ocean and eventually maybe uh, drowning in the, in the ocean. But uh, so, so it's very important that you uh, get these practices in place and uh, collaborate and get more functionality and capability to your customers more quickly as you can. So how to learn more, i just leave you with some um, ideas here. Uh, DevOps fundamentals, this is the start place, the first one that I showed you. The three-day course starts with an introduction and gets into culture and organization. Uh, it also talks a lot about the processes and then it gets into automation and uh, ends up with measurements and improvements. So how to measure this and you get a practice exam. And then optionally, you can take the exam. The exam is included as part of the fundamental certification, but you've got, I think, upwards of a year to actually go and write it, it is online. And it's a um, you know multiple point choice uh, questionnaire and you need to have a passing score of at least 65%. It takes about an hour to, to perform it. So last but not least, I've included in here a promotional starter kit. Uh, I've got a number of white papers. I mentioned a few times these reference links. This is all on a web page that I included uh, attached here to this presentation deck. Um, so you can go and launch on that starter kit and get a bunch of white papers and these links. I've also included um, two examples of certification that you can get an e-learning, which is a, a, a self-paced module that you can sign up anytime, very uh, attractive pricing. And as well, we've set up a, a virtual class for September. I, I know we're in the vacation period, but there's uh, a class set up for September timeframe that you could take a look joining uh, us in the future. And then we've got some promotional quotes here that, that if you act in, in the next uh, month, you will get uh, a discount on that. So those are some ways to quickly get you started. Uh, here's the resources. They're also in the starter kit. So these are the links that of some of these studies and tools uh, that I've shared with you. And at this point, I'm going to wrap it up here and see if there are any questions. I don't see any other questions. So at this point, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us and look forward to seeing you in the near future. Bye now.